Hi there. My name is Saria, and I'm a part of the team that brings you live from NYPL. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers. With us, we have Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, New York Times bestselling author of the widely celebrated novel, Mexican Gothic. Joining Sylvia in conversation is fellow writer and literary critic, Gabino Iglesias. Gabino will be chatting with Sylvia about her fantastic new novel, Velvet Was the Night. Uh, which Gabino calls in his book review for NPR, a noir with a heart of gold. Set in Mexico during the 1970s, the book is full of romance and music and looks at the lives of colorful characters caught in the middle of the Mexican Dirty War. I love this book so much and I can't wait for you to learn more about it in just a bit. You can borrow Velvet Was the Night for free with your NYPL library card, or if you don't have a card just yet, and you live in New York State, you can apply for one, so that way you can check out the book. We'll be uh, selling the book online through the library shop. Proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library. We'll be sharing the links to get the book in the chat. They can also be found on the event page at nypl.org live. Sylvia has also put together an amazing list of recommended reading for you. You can uh, check out the list and ways to access those titles from the library on the event page. We have so many exciting events coming up at Live from NYPL. Tomorrow, in partnership with NYC Audubon, Kristen Cooper leads a conversation about the lives of birds in our urban environment and efforts to make birding inclusive. On Thursday, journalist and philosopher Barrett Holmes Pittner speaks about his captivating new book on race and cultural erasure called The Crime Without a Name. Uh, further down the line, we have a panel discussion with National Book Foundation awarded authors on the next chapter of NYC Writing, Reading, and Living. We also have a conversation coming up on the future of New York after the uh, mayoral election. And uh, that's just a small sample of the amazing many programs that we have coming up, and we hope that you'll tune in again. These programs are made possible thanks to the generosity of folks like you, so please consider supporting the library however you can. Before I turn it over to tonight's speakers, there are a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to share. Uh, firstly, the library values your policy, so in the spirit of transparency, there are a couple of things we'd like for you to know. Even though the video and chat are on an NYPL.org page, they are hosted by YouTube. By participating in the chat, you might be sharing data about yourself, which the library does not control. For more details, you can visit our FAQ page, along with Google's privacy policy and the library's privacy policy, which can all be found on the event page. Sylvia would be glad to answer your questions about the book. You can send them at any time using the chat, Google form, or by emailing us at publicprograms at nypl.org. Sylvia will get to as many questions as she can as time allows at the end of the program. Real-time captions are available for tonight's program. You can click on the closed caption button or use the stream text link shared in the reminder email and chat for a live transcript. Now, without further ado, I would love to welcome Silvia Moreno-Garcia and Gabino Iglesias to our virtual stage. Hi. Hello. And uh, hello to all of those watching. Uh, Silvia, great to see you. It is a not very rare side because you are everywhere nowadays. So kudos and congrats on that. Uh, and congrats on this thing that we are here to discuss today, which I absolutely loved. And as they just mentioned, reviewed for NPR. Beautiful thing about reading uh, for a review is that you're pacing yourself and you're asking questions and you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to get at what the author was doing. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to not guess and ask you a few questions about the book. But before we get to that, there's a question that I've been meaning to ask you uh, probably for as long as I've been reading your work. And that is uh, a question that I love to ask folks like you, uh, like Brian Evanson, who are all over the place. And that is, how do you see genre? Because we claim you as a horror author, but you do it all. You do science fiction, you do noir. Um, how do you see genre and how do you approach it when you're, uh, you're doing your storytelling? Yes, I don't call myself a horror author, not because I don't like horror, but because I do a lot of very different things. And one of the problems sometimes is that people have misconceptions about 
the output of a writer. So if you have read Mexican Gothic and now you buy Belvis What Was a Night, I don't want people to be disappointed and to be like, oh my God, this is not horror. How could it be? I mean, one good rule of thumb is to actually read the back of the book and figure out what it's about. But sometimes people don't do that and you're filed in the wrong place. So I don't like calling myself a, a horror author. I am, um, I guess, a genre writer in the most expansive sense of the word, if you want to put it in a category. Genres and categories are interesting things. They provide boundaries, uh, opportunities for cataloging, and also for conversation between items. Literature is defined in many ways by how one book converses with another and one author converses with the other, the history of previous books and the contemporary landscape. But with that said, sometimes I think there is a um, sense of boxing in certain writers in certain categories and genre can become a prison rather than a landscape. True. Uh, and now in this case, uh, you mentioned Mexican Gothic, which I'm absolutely sure got you many new readers, which is a great thing. Uh, but this is an entirely different book. Those of us who have been following your career uh, got exactly what we were expecting, which is something entirely different and completely new uh, that, that goes in, in a wild new direction. Um, how would you describe it? Because as I was reading it, it's um, like most of your other work. I could tell folks, this is a really weird romance. I could tell them this is a book that celebrates history and music. Uh, this is a noir with Russians and guns and people running around. Uh, it's kind of a mystery as, as you're trying to think about that tape. Um, how would you present it? What was your vision, your, your one line pitch, if you will? Yeah, it's very much, I think, uh, an, a noir that is, playing with certain elements of popular culture, including music, including comic books, but it's grounded in the, in, you know, classic sort of noir. And one of the problems with noir is that it's hard to identify. I think a lot of people don't know what it is. It gets very confused. People think that noir is the same as a mystery. And it's, of course, a Sherlock Holmes mystery is not the same at all as a Jim Thompson novel. They're very different kind of creatures. And so, uh, that's, so that's one of the problems is that people often don't know kind of like what you're talking about. And the other thing is that in nowadays, what has become popular has been domestic noir, which has these certain, these certain traits. And it's this rich, wealthy white woman who is in danger. It has a lot in common, actually, with the Gothic. I consider domestic noirs to be kind of offshoots of Gothic for modern audiences. And it's fine that there is this kind of category, but it was very difficult to sell Velvet Was a Night because editors would tell me, well, nobody reads noir anymore. Everybody wants just domestic noir. And I didn't want to do a novel about high class characters, you know, whose husband is cheating on them, that kind of situation, which is the bread and butter of the domestic noir. They want to do that kind of book, but I was getting a lot of kind of like pushback from nobody wants to read uh, sort of noir and even worse, like a historical noir in the 1970s in Mexico. Like that's like, nobody wants to look at this. So it's it's an interesting book. I um, It's really very grounded in, in its time and period in, in which it's taking place, but it's also echoing a lot of the classic noirs that I really love and a lot of the Latin American noir that is emerging in that time period. Awesome, because that kind of segues into a later question. Uh, first of all, I completely agreed. It is that quintessential noir. They're, they're waiting in a car as the rain pours. Uh, it is that that dark heart of noir. It's, it's, it drips off every page. Uh, but you sort of mentioned uh, the time period, and it, it's also a historical novel. In fact, you have a line towards the end uh, where you say, uh, real horror. So we're talking about the dirty war. We're talking about things that happened. We're talking about the opening of the book being a real thing. Uh, first of all, what drew you to it? It's just this really interesting time period that is not uh, almost traumatic time period that has been explored in Mexico. And at the same time, it hasn't because it's kind of been hidden away. We all sort of know about the dirty war and what happened, but it was something that was very hushed. So the archives for that were not released until a few years ago when we got uh, this big release of papers of some of the documents that showed what had happened um, 
it was not included in official textbooks until three years ago that those massacres and attacks that happened. And the people who committed these crimes have never been brought to justice. So in a way, even though we kind of know about it in another, in another, in another sense, it almost feels like it's this corpse that we hid away in the um, in our house and it's just rotting away there in, in the corner. And I like, you know, taking the bricks apart and looking at the corpses of things. Awesome. Uh, and second question related to that, can you tell us a little bit about the research? Because it's not only the city, which you bring, you know, completely alive to the page, it's also the music, it's it's the the, the customs of the time, it's what people were doing, it's it's the comic books, uh, it's the, the political, you know, strain of the time. So it's obvious that, you know, this is a novel, it's fiction, but it's also the type of fiction that as you're reading it, you go, wow, there must have been a lot of reading and researching behind uh, creating this, this fiction because it's fiction that takes place uh, in a real world. So can you tell us a little bit about that research? Yeah, there was um, a lot of looking at newspapers and archival stuff. So I let me take up my helpful slide. So this is oh, the front page okay. of uh, La Prensa, and it says foreign terrorists. So what happened was that a lot of the attacks that the government was committing against its own people were being blamed on, you know, foreign powers interfering, like this is all being done by um, other people who are trying to undermine our nation. And um, so there's, there was a lot of archival stuff that I was looking, newspapers, accounts of people during the dirty war, Here's a book, let me see if I have it. Okay, so this is one uh, supposedly written by one of the Hawks, but actually composed by the Mexican government so they could blame kind of like another party. So the official ruling party kind of saying, this is the authentic story of what happened, but they're just kind of uh, mispacing blame. There's also uh, comic books, which are like, this is a comic book. This is an American one. And this is uh, the Mexican one. So, so those are romance comic books of the time here. There's music, obviously, which I touch upon in the book. I don't have any vinyl right now, I, although I still have a record player somewhere. And so there's all these real elements that are being poured into a traditional noir uh, story. So I had to know the skeleton of the time, so what was going on pretty well. There were some things that I already knew by virtue of growing up in Mexico, by virtue of my parents, and there were other things that I had to learn more about as, um, as I went down this kind of rabbit hole of information of what had happened during the Dirty War. And there's some things that are, that you just don't kind of believe would happen, but they do happen in Mexico. It's, it, it's kind of insane, uh, sort of what the government gets away with and what, what it's up to in this time period. Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked that question because we got a, we got to see some of the material. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and that little, uh, that little romance comic novel that you, you pulled out at the end uh, gives us a perfect segue into talking about uh, your two main characters. Obviously, let's go with Maite first. As, as a young kid who loved books, I couldn't help but relate. Uh, it's easier to escape and, and live inside the world that, that she was reading in those books. Uh, but at the same time, she doesn't seem to have any sort of motor inside her pushing her to a better life. So in a way, it was also a kind of slightly sad character. Uh, we wanted to see her do well. We, we didn't know if she had what it took. Um, it, 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 it was her time. Um, what, how was the process, and I'm not going to call it uh, a character development because this was obviously character engineering. <laughs> uh, you did all this research, you obviously had your, your, your story in mind, you knew what, the, what kind of story you wanted to tell. How does uh, uh, Maite come about? What, what goes into, into creating her as a character? Maite is very much this middle class sort of character that is just keeping her head down. I think often when we when we think about times of political upheaval, everybody says, well, I would join the revolution and march in the streets and uh, kill the bad guys. And that's not what happens. That's not what happens in reality. That's not what happened in Mexico. That's what not happens almost in any place in the world. And 
what happens when you are under that kind of political regime is that you go to work, right? You pick, you take the bus, you put your head down and you keep on living. And I wanted to get that reality, that mundanity of, of life just existing. And that mundanity is also reflected in Elvis's work because it sounds bad, but torture and oppression are very mundane tasks. They're very bureaucratic. So when you're looking at how somebody tortured something or some of the things that happened in this context, it is at times darkly hilarious and also darkly boring. You've got these agents kind of sitting outside somebody's house, spying on somebody. And um, a lot of times uh, they're just like eating, chatting about their lives, smoking cigarettes, and then they're going to you know, go kill somebody and go beat somebody. And that's kind of the reality that you see sometimes in the archives and in conversations with people who were involved in this time period. There's this just mundanity of life. And that's the real horror of it. The real horror of it is not that um, you know, atrocities occur, but it's your neighbor who is responsible for the atrocity. Right. Um... And now we have to talk about Elvis, obviously. Uh, I think he embodies uh, one of the many hearts of noir for me, which is you take a normal quote unquote good individual and you put him in, under special circumstances and then they might do things that seem really bad and dark. Uh, and he's a good kid. You get the sense that he's a very good kid. Uh, again, as you mentioned, doing pretty awful things. Uh, but But we sort of, we're rooting for him throughout the, at least I was throughout the whole novel. Uh, you know that he's not completely in love with the gig. Uh, yes, he's sitting out there smoking the cigarettes in the rain and, uh, and he aspires to have uh, something that looks like your background right now. You know, I wanna have my music and, and, and my books. So how did he uh, come about? Yeah, the Hawks were a very kind of, um multifaceted group. They came from many different backgrounds. And one of the backgrounds that they came from quite often was the lower classes. This was a good gig for young men who had no other prospects. You can kind of think about, well, what do you do? Like you could be a gang member or you could get a steady paycheck. And this is a steady paycheck. It's kind of like a step up in the world for a lot of people. And this is the reality of some of the people that become involved in this, in this kind of activity. But it's also the reality of if you've lived in a kind of low class neighborhood or, you know, stricken by poverty, like I have, at, you know, some points in my life and, and some of the people that I grew up with, that things get pretty dark and people do what they need to do to sort of survive. It, it, it gets very Darwinian and you can kind of judge it from afar and say, okay, well, that's just horrible. But on, on the other hand, living it through it in the moment, um, sometimes the choices that you make are not the best choices simply because you don't have the other opportunities that other people that other people have. Uh, and so violence as a career choice sometimes really is the best thing that you can aspire to in life. Good to know if this whole writing thing doesn't work out. Uh, I have an excuse now. Uh, with these two characters, there's a lot of things that you could have done. Uh, but I love what you did, which is, I'm gonna give you, uh, I think I just called it a weird love story at the beginning of this thing. There are these parallel planets and they move forward without ever sort of, you're, you're kind of waiting for them to clash. And there's times when they come almost together and there's a little bit of contact and then they go their separate ways again. Uh, so it's not a standard romance. Um, we, we get to know them separately throughout the whole book, but you almost force the reader to imagine them together because they have these things that they love that would make them, you know, a, probably a couple that, that would work out. Um, what, was the, what was the thought process behind, this is how I'm gonna have their, their trajectories uh, throughout the entire book mostly uh, and not have them come together at, a, at another point and say, you know, a lot of noir has romance in it, so I'm just gonna go that classic route. Yeah, it's, um, it's a play, I think, on expectations sometimes. Well, when you work with genre, you either work with the expectations of the reader and you follow the tropes or you kind of work against them. And I'm doing kind of trying to do both things when I write. So I try to give people some elements that would be considered kind of classic noir, but also sort of uh, twist some of the expectations. One of the standard tropes of noir 
is the femme fatale, right? The beautiful, deadly woman. And one of the reasons why Maite is the way she is, is because she stands in stark contrast to the beautiful, deadly woman. She is not the beautiful femme fatale. She's anything but. And so there's this unexpected element in that sense. The other thing is that juxtaposing a genre such as romance with something like noir seemed to me really fitting because both were pulp fiction. These romances that I showed you with the cover were things that when you would go buy them at the newsstand, they would be clipped to the side of the newsstand and you would get your romance. But right next to it, there were other kinds of comic books and there were Westerns and there were policiacos, you know, police stories. And so you could very much be standing right next to the newsstand as a child, as I did, and be looking at the cover of one thing that was like murder, murder, murder. And next to it, a Cinderella love story. And they're just right next to each other in the new stand. And, you know, people are, are buying one or the other, but just the experience of standing as a child and looking at those two genres that apparently don't have anything in common, yet are both in many ways entirely escapist sort of pulp fiction for the masses. This is really the fiction for the masses. And in Mexico, the thing that people read back in the day were comic books. Those were when you got on a bus, your bus driver, he was always reading these little raunchy comic books with naked girls and things like that as he was waiting for the fair. It was, it's a literature of the low classes of the people. And so you get that, those two streams right there. And I wanted to see, to see them both come together and, and kind of clash because they're not, you know, they have different values, different ideas. So kind of see what happens when somebody who wants to live in a romance novel end up being tossed into the other comic book um, at the newsstand, which is the, the crime, the noir, the, the novela, the um, nota roja. Right. Um, and I'm going to jump a couple of questions because you just mentioned uh, uh, novela de nota roja and policiacos. As, as somebody who uses a second language uh, in your novels from time to time, this is a, the second question that I've been meaning to ask you forever because I write bilingual fiction. How do you select? The, I'm going to use a word like um, machine. You're so machine when you're doing this. You always select a very specific word that might not translate well. Um, and I know how that process works for me, but I'm wondering how it works for you when you're, you know, inhabiting this interstitial space between English and Spanish. Um, and usually you, you, show, you showed us that cover. Uh, you're reading some of that research in Spanish as well. Uh, so how do you translate that first and then decide what goes in English, which was most of it, and uh, what are you going to sprinkle in um, in Spanish? Yeah, I, I try to write mostly in English because my characters, although they're, you're, they're not, you know, it's not like they're speaking in English. It's just, the, it's written out like that, but they are supposed to be speaking in Spanish in this case. And so I want to keep the majority of the text in English. I don't like dropping a random Spanish word for no reason. Like, querido, look at that. There is a pájaro on the, you know, on the windowsill. <laughs> the chancla you writing. Have said, Darling, there's a bird on the windowsill. Yeah. And it would be perfectly understandable in English. And so some people, I think, expect that. They expect that kind of exoticism where if you don't have enough, like, kind of salt in the soup, then it's not Mexican. And I don't like to do that. I like to make you feel Spanish by the rhythm of my writing and by other techniques that don't necessarily need you to be, you know, every fifth word, it's going to be in Spanish for no goddamn reason, you know, like mijo. And, and you know, when you're speaking about somebody who is maybe Mexican American and living in Texas and something like that, maybe they might pepper some of their conversation like that, um, you know, mixing English and Spanish, but we're talking about people set in Mexico. So they're not doing that. You're just hearing them speak in English, but they're really speaking in Spanish. So the words that I keep are the words that are completely untranslatable, you know, and, or that I think that the meaning would be diluted if it was not included. And I did something funny with Velvet Rose and I, I made a choice about the names where um, the names of the agents that are kind of Elvis's co-workers, I render in Spanish as Mago yeah. and um, El Tunas, and, but there's one guy who's El called Gaspacho, the Antelope. Yeah you know, and he's in English. And you might ask why. And it's because I looked at the names that agents were using during this time period. And the naming of agents and of narcos is really funny. They pick names that you wouldn't necessarily think a gangster would have. I think Americans think, oh, well, a gangster would be called Tough Tony. But you've got 
Narcos like La Barbie, you know, he's called the Barbie, like the Barbie doll. And that's his nickname. And you find that in a lot of these agents that they have really funny code names and criminals too. So there was um, one guy who uh, was a porro, an infiltrator. And that's an example of a word that is not translatable easily into English, porro. It has a very specific meaning, but in general, it means an infiltrator of student groups, of university groups. And he um, was called El Fish, just like that in English, El Fish. You know, don't ask me why he was called El Fish. He was a chemistry student, and uh, but that was his nickname. So I kept the, anti the, the, the antelope because I thought in Spanish he would have been called the antelope, like in like in English. That was that was his thing. But I translated El Mago because I thought you know El Mago would be called El Mago, and uh, all these other characters would be called El Huero. He would be Huero, not not Blondie. Uh, you know that wouldn't have been his nickname. And so those were um, that was kind of like a bit of an inner joke for me, which I don't know if anybody will get, but it was kind of like my own inner joke because sometimes gangsters and things like that do use English sounding names and things like that um, for the for themselves, even though they are. Um, in, in Mexico, the cutie or, or, or whatever, something, something like that. And yeah, gangster names and criminal names and uh, agent names of this time period are very interesting, very odd. And you wonder why would somebody be called, you know, the Barbie, Barbie doll? Um, I think it's because the tougher you are as a guy, the sillier the nickname that you can have. And it's, it's, it's kind of like a show of masculinity in a way, you know? If, you, if you're called Petunia and you're this guy who like disembowels people, you're pretty tough. You can you can take anything. You're Petunia. <laughs> can you pull it off? <laughs> yes, can you pull it off? Uh, uh, I loved uh, the stuff that you had to say about the literature of the people and uh, literature is here in, in the comic books and, and, and those little uh, romantic novels that she reads. But so is music. Music is there from beginning to end to the point that you have a playlist at the end of the novel. And music seems to be an element, a recurring element in, in your work. How do you bring it in? Because what you listen to, what you connect to says a lot about a character. Uh, but first you have to identify what's sounding on the radio at this precise point in time in history. Uh, where would they listen to it? And, and how would they relate to the specific type of music? So it's not just picking songs at random. There's an entire process that goes into creating, you know, the, the, the massive amount of, of music that's uh, intertwined in, in, uh, with your story. How do you go about doing that? And how have you done it before? Because this is not the first time that we've heard, uh, you know, of music in your work. No, my first novel, Signal to Noise, was very much about music, music and magic in, in 1980s Mexico. I didn't want to repeat myself. So in my first sort of drafts, I tried to block out the music as much as possible. I was, I was writing it out, trying not to mention songs or just saying music played and not being specific. And then there was a point when I realized that I needed to bring in the music. I couldn't avoid it, even though I thought I might repeat myself. And it was when I was reading this account of this guy who was an activist during the dirty war period, and he is arrested and taken to, to prison and he's being held in a cell. And, uh, and he mentions two things about music. One that the, guards would put this really loud tropical music that he hated you know he just hated it, it was like torture you know and, and you couldn't talk with other people because this music was so loud blasting down the hallway and then he mentions this other part where um they're coming to his cell and they're taking him to be tortured and he remembers what was playing on the radio and and when i realized that he remembered what was playing on the radio i thought i have to include music there's just there's no way around it. It's just this really important component of, of life. I'm glad it won. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fight it, let it happen. Um, <laughs> you already talked a little bit about what, what drew you to, uh, uh, to the dirty war, uh, but you mentioned uh, not being super easy to sell. Um, do you think that had a little bit more to do with we want the, the rich white housewife trying to spy on the husband or is it 
do, do you think it was a concern about, you know, 70s Mexico, there might be a cultural difference that uh, most readers will have a, a hard time? Or do you think the success of Mexican Gothic made a lot of publishers think, oh, this is the new horror it girl, uh, and, and we better get a, another horror novel? Um, because it's a, it's an amazing novel, so I'm really surprised to hear you say that it was kind of <laughs> kind of like a hard sell. Um, can you tell a little bit about that? Because I'm really curious. Yeah, I think it was everything that you mentioned at the same time. People kind of want you to do something that has been tried and true. So if you had a big horror hit, I think the natural expectation is that you would write another horror novel. And I wanted to go in a different direction. And I think um, you know, Penguin wasn't. Um, very sure about that. And, and when we were shopping this around, other people were also not very sure about it, about considering it. They were like, eh. And um, also, yeah, definitely the setting. We got a lot of pushback. People thinking it's not the kind of thing that anybody would want to read in the United States, right? About this, this event in Mexico, this obscure thing that happened in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, yeah, the noir, it's just the, the noir element is being, uh, well, you know, what, what's hot right now is, is like uh, murdered women and um, disappearing wives and that kind of thing. Why don't you do something like that rather than this really mundane, grim, dirty sort of novel? And, but I wanted to do this, this, this kind of novel and I just stuck to it. And my agent, fortunately, is very nice and he has never said no to me even when I make it very hard for him to sell some of my books so he persevered and we and we got the book and I was just lucky that Mexican Gothic came out and was such a big hit I think without that I wouldn't have been able to sell it to be honest awesome just a word to the wise the next novel and I don't know what that is it'll be different it will not be Mexican Gothic and it will not be uh, Velvet Was the Night. So I think publishers should be ready for that. <laughs> Whatever it is, uh, it might be sci-fi, it might take, you know, space opera. I don't know. It's Sylvia. Uh, let's wait for it. <laughs> um, the Obviously, your life, uh, you're coming from an event or, or from work, you're doing this, you have something uh, coming up next. Um, now it gets thrown whenever you're mentioned New York Times bestseller, Silvia Moreno Garcia, which is awesome and that it's great. But my real question is, do you see finally a little bit of a change? Because it seemed like in a very short amount of time, we had you, Stephen Graham Jones and Sean Cosby. And as a person of color, I was like, yes, it's finally happening. We're discovering all these other voices that have amazing novels out there right now. And they're getting the recognitions and selling the amount of copies that they should have been selling from day one. Uh, Do you think we're finally seeing a shift where uh, a a woman named Sylvia can can sell a book set in the 1970s? Um, Or do you think in five years it'll go back or will it be easier um, in terms of diversity? Well, it's really funny because my event after this is with Steven over at the Vancouver Writers Festival. Awesome. <laughs> so, and, and, and the thing is that it, it looks like it's an overnight sensation, but I've known Steven's work for many years. And I think I've been around for as long as, I don't know if as long as he has in novels, but certainly like in short stories and things like that, we've both been kind of contemporaries. We're both more or less the same age. So we've both been around the block, but people tend to not notice even if you've done like a lot of stories and things like that. And then it's suddenly like, oh, you know, um, you're so famous all of a sudden, it's like 15 years of hard work, my friend. But, so that's kind of like the on the ground reality. But the other thing is that it's, even though you have people like me and maybe Steven and um, books like Rise of Blade Tears, which are doing very well. And I'm really happy um, for, for those writers. It, it gets a little bit Highlander-ish sometimes in publishing. People think, oh, we got our Black writer, we got our you know, Native American writer, and we got our Mexican, everything is good, and now we can forget about diversity and proceed with life. And so that's a really kind of big pitfall. And the other thing is that even though like Stephen and, and Sean and all, and all these other people have been doing, and, and me have been doing very well and very happy about that, you cannot believe the number of copies that American Dirt sold. I, I mean, I, I have access to BookScan and I can tell you that book outsold me by a magnitude of like six to one, like immense amounts of money. And so you can see that uh, it's not a level playing field where 
uh, I, I don't know how much money they're going to put into Alex Segura's uh, release next year, for example. I hope they do, Secret Identity, which is coming out next year. And I know Kelly Garrett has a new book, which has a really nice cover. I hope they're getting paid really well. And I hope they get a lot of support for the release and it just doesn't fall into a black hole because theoretically we're all kind of like, you know, ha ha ha, we're all, you know, big Mr. Money Bucks. But then you see that the industry really pushed this other book a lot more than any of any Latino book by a Latino author last year. It's like, you know, just enormous the amount of money and attention that that title got for good and ill. But like the industry really, it, it you know, it knows the horses that it's betting on. And you can, you can purchase uh, 20 manuscripts from 20 brilliant writers, but if you're not gonna give them uh, proper publicity, a decent cover, which is something that I have fought for so long, you have no idea how hard it is sometimes to get a decent cover, uh, you know, a press release and sufficient advanced review copies. If you're not going to do all these things that take that, that are necessary for having a successful launch. That's when you have writers suddenly go, you know, disappear into a hole. And then the publishing industry, instead of saying, maybe we didn't market this right, or, um, you know, what was it that we didn't do right? They say it's because the author was black. That's that's the explanation. Right. The author was black. No more black books anymore for anybody. And that's a really shitty thing because I know very well that as a prominent Mexican writer, I'm in a good position and also in a lousy position that for example, um, you know, Velvet Was a Night hasn't been selling gangbusters. So I'm in danger of, you know, uh, honestly fucking it up for Alex and other people. <laughs> if, you know, if I don't sell enough copies, this is a really big pressure that other people don't feel, but that we have sometimes that it's like, oh my God, I'm the first Mexican writer that did this. And if I don't do it right, then there will be nobody behind me. And that's really unfair. It's not anybody's fault, you know, how I perform, how good or how well something was received, but it can realistically affect other writers that are selling manuscripts right now uh, for good and ill. For good, it's like, well, if you have something that comes well to Mexican Gothic, you're lucky. And if you don't, maybe you're unlucky because maybe you're going to have an editor telling you, well, you know, what really sells is Mexican Gothic. So this really sensitive story about uh, growing up uh, in the border and um, being a teenager uh, in Tijuana is just not for us, you know, come back when you have a horror story in a mansion. That's not fair. That's not fair. I think it's, it's great. And I hope folks at home are, are taking notes. Uh, I was, I did an event, I interviewed uh, Kelly Garrett and Walter Mosley last week. And Kelly was saying that right after uh, George Floyd, publishers couldn't find enough black authors to throw money at, but it's not throwing money at them. It's like, all right, so now you have all these books. Are you going to push them just as hard? Are we going to see them at Sam's Club? Are we going to be able to buy the paperback at, at, at Walgreens? Um, so I, you know, what I what I see uh, from authors like you now is saying like, yes, it's it's here. It's a little bit of a change. The fight is not over. We have to keep fighting just as hard as as we've been fighting uh, to have folks like like you and Sean and and Stephen. Uh, because if not, then it'll crumble and they'll have an excuse. Like, we, we get another Mexican writer? No, we don't, because we gave Sylvia an opportunity, uh, and she had two or three gigantic novels, and the last one was not a New York Times bestseller, so she messed it up for everybody else. Um, so, yes, which is a great way of saying, hey, folks, if you're looking at this right now, go buy this right now. Uh, buy two. Buy one from your mom, and uh, buy three. One, one for your... Um, Best friend too. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes before we go into the Q&A. Uh, there's one question that I really love to ask uh, authors that have quote unquote made it, which is not a thing in this business. You never make it. You just push forward and write the next one. Uh, but is that I've been going to these things for many years and I've always felt that there's a small group that gets neglected, which is new writers, upcoming writers who don't get to do this type of event and they're sitting there with a pen in hand, trying to get some kind of advice, some, some word of wisdom from somebody who's uh, been around the block a few times as a writer, as an editor, as a literary critic. Um, we have you here. And I was that guy about you know two years ago. 
So I'm asking you, do you have any words of advice for those watching who are just starting in this really weird business of ours? Yeah, it's, it is a weird business. And one of the problems is that it's not something with an easy trajectory. So it's not a Pokemon kind of evolution where, you know, you start as a chicken with wings and then you become a super chicken with wings that spouts fire. And then, you know, you go through your forms. It's, it's not like that. Writing is really, uh, it's up and it's ups and downs. It's snakes and ladders. You go up, then you go down, you, you know, you, you get a hit, then you, then you fail completely. You get a deal, then there's no deal. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that, that happens with writing. So if you want writing to be your career, and I must say that writing does not need to be your career. There are a lot of people who they're just like, you know, I just like to write a story once in a while and, and, and that kind of thing. I don't want to be a full-time writer. But if you are thinking um, about being a full-time writer, really learn about the business of full-time writing. It's a lot less glamorous than you imagine. Like everything in life, we get sold images of... Um, you know, glamour and uh, and riches. This is a fake background with fake volumes behind you. Behind this, there's a couch that is a pullout. And I write in an attic in a townhouse in one of the most expensive cities of the world, which is why, why I've always had a day job. But, you know, just look at the business, look at it as something, the freelancer's life and whether that would be a style that you want to pursue and then, you know, begin pursuing it Normally, the first book you write won't be the first book you sell, and hopefully you have a chance to grow as an author and write several books, but don't also feel, um, um, yeah, like, like it's the end of the world if like you don't get an agent, the, you know, in, in your first month of sending something out. It can take time, and don't feel too pressured by comparing yourself to a New York Times bestselling author and, and being like, oh, my God, I, I don't have a book tour. Most people don't have book tours. I've never had a book tour and I'm fine. And so, yeah, just keep your expectations realistic. Um, dream. Do dream. Don't don't be like, don't. I'm not saying don't dream, but, but keep expectations realistic. Do dream and have goals and things that you want to achieve. And have fun with it and keep learning all the time. It's really, it's fun because it's one of those things that doesn't kind of end. It's not like you reach module one of being a writer. Congratulations. Nothing more will ever happen with being a writer. It, it's a constant learning and studying the field. So it's, it's actually quite fun, I think. And it's a cheap hobby, which is something that I have always said, unlike other things <laughs> where like my husband likes to do woodwork and wood is expensive. Um, Google Docs is free for all. So, you know, just type away, um, see what you come up with and just keep going. And like I said, not everybody needs to be a full-time working writer. Some people just love to be able to write a story here once in a while or a poem, or they just want to write one book, the one book that they have inside their heart. They don't want to have a trilogy. They don't want to have 10 books. And that's also perfectly fine. So ask yourself what kind of writer you want to be and, uh, and then, try to pursue it, but don't expect that it'll be um, like a thing where it's easily mapped. That's also part of the downside of it, but part of the fun is that you don't know what will happen. The dice just rolls and then you end up in um, uh, some weird square of a board game. I can't remember what the Monopoly squares are right now. Baltic Avenue, I think is the only one that I ever buy. It's not that expensive. <laughs> it's one of the not Park Avenue, ones. it's not Park Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome advice. Um, and uh, before we, uh, first of all, if you're listening, watching, make sure that you get your uh, your questions in because we're only going to select a few because uh, we don't have all the time in the world. Uh, but it's obvious that uh, as soon as you start doing the thing for real, people start noticing your name and then you attach New York Times bestselling author to that, you are getting probably half a dozen blurb requests daily. Uh, and you have all these gorgeous leather bound volumes behind you. Uh, I love to ask writers about stuff that they've been reading. You know, we know that folks are gonna go buy this as soon as we are done here, if they haven't bought it yet on their phone, which is also an option. Uh, but what have you been reading that you're like, oh my God, as, as, a, as an editor, as a reader, as, as a fan of literature, I think people should check out this thing uh, if you care to recommend some books. 
Yeah, I have to finish my blurbing. I owe people stuff. I, I read Alex Segura's <laughs> upcoming novel, which is uh, Secret Identity, and it's about comic books. And it's also set in the 1970s, interestingly enough, but in New York City. So that was that was kind of fun. Um, I read Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, and that's a horror novella. I like novellas because yes. there's this easily digestible thing. And it, it might be fun for people who um, who want something Halloween-y. It is really creepy. And then what else? <laughs> um, oh, well, Tananarive Due had a re-release of The Between, which I believe was her first novel. It has a really beautiful cover, the new edition. I highly recommend it. It's about this man who, when he was a child, almost drowned, but was saved from drowning by his grandmother. And she died tragically trying to save him. And then many years later, he starts having these weird experiences. And you don't know, like, is this guy going insane or is there something supernatural going on here? And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's this very interesting uh, portrayal of this guy that is just suddenly, whoa, what, what's happening around around the world? And really nice to see it in a reissue. Um, sometimes things don't get reissued and you have to go hunt for them at the used bookstore and it's very hard to get. But I was really pleased to see this one in the market again. Awesome. Uh, and yes, uh, I think uh, the fact that Alex is getting all this love so early, because I think it comes out in March, um, should be an indication uh, that folks need to go pre-order that as soon as possible. Um, and uh, I don't see any questions. Um, here we go. So excited to read this. I'm curious about your process of writing historical and how you research and adapt your voice and dialogue for the time period. Oh, so I yeah. guess we, we talked about the research, but uh, yeah, how do you take uh, words, dialogue, stuff that was happening at the time uh, and adapt it to, to your own voice? Yeah, so I, I did something funny with, well, with Velvet Was a Night, which is that El Mago, who is a higher class, operative in this novel doesn't use contractions in his dialogue so in, he speaks without contractions and that's to kind of indicate in English a difference in class between him and Elvis so Elvis is talking kind of with a lower uh, the way a lower class kid would would talk and El Mago is posher so he's posher in his choice of words and he never uses contractions so that was a way to play with that it varies by the book but that's how I did it for Velvet Was a Night. And I think you mentioned, uh, I'm gonna jump to this one. You mentioned uh, the importance of covers. Uh, covers sell books. That whole thing about not judging a book by its cover. People love to say it, but I think they do. They judge a book by its cover all the time. Uh, so somebody asked if you got input. Did you get a lot of input uh, in terms of the cover for Velvet Was the Night? Yes, I've been lucky with several of my publishers in the past few years that I have been able to give input and they actually have listened to me. It's bad when you give input and nobody cares and they just like, uh, you're just getting a bird on a cover, you know, because that's the stock photo that we had. So luckily I have, and we work through this one because the initial version that we got was nice looking and not dissimilar for this one, but it had several anachronisms that I noticed in terms of the hair and um, some other stuff that wasn't working right. I ended up sending photos of my mother from the 1970s for them to see what, you know, somebody would have looked like in that time period. And we, and we had um, also, we've also done work on other covers to get it right. And with Mexican Gothic, which was also Penguin Random House, the initial, uh, figure that came back was kind of the same, a very similar layout, the woman with the red dress, but she was really pale. Like she was really white. And I was like, that's, that's really it's not gonna go paler than me, dude. You know, it's not going to work. Um, yeah. So that sort of thing. So they do pay attention to me at least now, or they don't complain too much when I say something. All right. That's good. I hope it stays that way. Uh, I'm going to jump to this one because it's a really interesting music question. Uh, can you speak about the significance of the various Blue Velvet versions, Bennett versus Cyrock? Oh, yes. Well, that depends which one you like better. Um, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing that a collector knows about, right? Uh, most people 
it's like when you talk about comic books and cover variants and, and that kind of stuff, you, you say that to a regular person and they don't care. I mean, it's like Superman, whatever, you know, issue 15, who, you know, who, who cares about cover variants. But if you are really into that kind of collecting, you do care about things like the line notes in an, in an album or the pressing in, in an album or the editions in a book, people who go, you know, first edition as opposed to third edition. It's the same goddamn text. What's the difference? But it makes a lot of difference for collectors. So it just, you know, it gives you this insight that um, both of these people are approaching music as connoisseurs or slubbers of music. And like, uh, like Maite said, she dated this guy who couldn't understand why she had records. He was like, why don't you just turn on the radio and, uh, and, and listen to music? If, if you've ever met anybody who collects DVDs or things like that, or that kind of artifact, it, it, it's it's not that yes you can stream it on netflix but maybe you want to own the criterion edition of the samurai or or, or or some kind of movie like that it's it's a different kind of mindset and it just shows us how these two people kind of come together in that sense now whether you like the banner or the price talk i mean i don't know i leave it up to everybody <laughs> to determine that <laughs> one right and i and agreed because uh we could get everything cheaper um on ebook and we don't, we, we buy the hardback for a reason. Um, your writing uh, is so atmospheric and cinematic at times. I'm curious if it comes together for you as images or words initially when you are creating. Um, I think it depends a lot. I play a lot with dialogue and I like to hear the characters. So I often do dialogue exercises, especially early on when I'm writing a book to see how the character sounds in my mind. So I, tap, I talk back and forth with characters, which sounds very weird when you see me doing it because it sounds that I'm insane, but I'm trying to hear what they're saying and how they're saying it before I kind of put it down. I'm trying to find the character through those exercises. So those are very much word related because we're talking about spoken words. Then for images, there are some things where I, there's, a central image that I find like, oh my God, I'm going to do, I'm going to use this in this book. And I don't know where it's going to land maybe, but I am going to have this set piece in this book. And for Bell, it was a night. One of the set pieces that I had really early on was when Elvis gets beaten up in this kind of store storage room with a newspaper. I had that really early on. I, I didn't quite know who was beating him <laughs> in my initial <laughs> Uh, kind of notes, but I know it was going to happen and he was going to get beat up uh, to a certain song. So that I knew it was just really clear. Some of the awesome. rest had to be built up. Uh, I'm going to read this one. Uh, it's really interesting because I think it, it it's a throwback to uh, my comment on the two planets. And obviously we're not going to spoil the ending for anybody here, but a very interesting question. Uh, it says, congratulations on an amazing book. It seems to me that in your novels, regardless of genre, the tone of the ending tends to be hopeful. And this is perhaps why I love all of them. Could you please share your views on this? Maybe I'm completely wrong on this. Um, so what about hope? I think they can go both ways often. Some are grimmer than, than others. Um, and some are really very happy. The beautiful ones ends on a happy note because it's a play on romance. And so therefore, um, I think what, what's the Shakespeare thing, if it ends in a, if it has a wedding, then it's a comedy. And if not, then it's, you know, it's a tragedy. Um, so it's that kind of story. So it's definitely, you know, happy comedy kind of thing. But I think with things like uh, Mexican Gothic, you know, you can see it both ways, glass half well, half empty. You can wonder what's going to happen after. Is this really a happy ending truly? But I guess for the moment uh, in some of these mm. books, yeah, it's like, it's happy enough for considering what happened before. I think it's happy <laughs> enough that might the, you know, and Elvis get the yeah. kind of ending that they get. Yeah. After a lot of people die. Yeah. Which I is, mean. <laughs> so it's a little bit of hope after everybody dies. Um, let me see if I missed something. Uh, your books are so multi-layered, setting, world building, plot, etc. But amazing character relationships, many duos seem to be at the heart of many. How do you develop and build? And I guess they're talking about the duos. Oh, yeah. How do you build yeah. teams. Yeah. Yeah. Pairs. Um, it depends on the book. Uh, 
Gods of Gate and Shadow was a lot about duality. And so there's a lot of built in uh, doubles that are doubling each other during the book. Yes, <laughs> that, <laughs> that one. And um, then you have things that are really a lot more ensemble. It, there's a lot of point of views in certain dark things. So even though you have two people that are central to the story, uh, Domingo and, and the vampire in that story, you do get a lot of multi points of views. And uh, Mexican Gothic is one point of view, but I do like kind of pairing odd couples, people who you wouldn't probably imagine would be coming together, coming together and what happens when, when you see that taking place. So in, in this one, you know, Elvis and Maite being kind of very different and yet similar at the same time is, is one of those fun things. Awesome. Uh, I think those are the questions we have for now. So please uh, give Stephen uh, a hug from me. Uh, <laughs> it's virtual, so I'll, I'll wave it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, exactly. <laughs> Tell him I say hi. Uh, and uh, as I hold this up, do you have any parting words um, about the book, about the thing, about anything, so we can send folks home? Oh, um, yeah, I hope people like the novel. If you don't like it, don't write it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, if you do like the novel, um, please, please talk about it. It's, it's this very weird thing where we, the pandemic has made book selling sometimes more difficult than it already was, especially right now with supply chains and things like that. So Sometimes people are like, no, I don't want to talk about it until December or, or some later on point in time, but talk about it now so people can get their orders in. It, it's really, and of anything that you want, like try to get your orders in early. Um, word of mouth is really useful. So any writer always appreciates it. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. It's very different from some of my other work, but I'm very proud of it. My next novel will be out July of 2022. And it's called The Daughter of Dr. Moreau out from Del Rey Books. It's um, interpretation of the island of Dr. Moreau, but set in 19th century Southern Mexico. I hope people come for that. Again, it's very different from my previous work. And uh, I guess that's it. I hope uh, everybody has a good time and uh, please support your library and your, and your local bookstore. Uh, be nice to yeah. Your library employees and your bookstore employees too. They're very tired, but you know, they work hard for you. <laughs> yes. And and they're more than happy to to get you signed copies or whatever else you want. Just ask. Yes. Uh, and they'll make it happen. Uh Sylvia, thank you very much for being here today. And uh, I wish you and Velvet all the success in the world. Thank you, Gavino. Very nice meeting you and bye everybody. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org live.